Welcome, welcome everybody at this uh, last lecture of the season of Studium Generale. Usually we stop around May, beginning of May often with the Schumann lecture for instance, but we have a very special guest and that is because the Department of Knowledge Engineering is celebrating its 25th anniversary. Happy birthday to you, I see them sitting here. Anybody of the Department of Knowledge Engineering who was there 25 years ago? One, one, and he's sitting in the middle right here, Frank Tausman. So congratulations especially to you. Um, because the Department of Knowledge Engineering is uh, celebrating its 25th anniversary, they organized an inter interesting congress. They have invited very interesting guests, and uh, one of them is here tonight for us to speak to you. So thank you very much, Department of Knowledge Engineering, to coming to us to have this opportunity to have this speaker here. We have some pictures, maybe you'll recognize him uh, uh, later on. Uh, it's not Putin, I can tell, it's one of the others on the pictures, but let me start introducing our guest, Andreas Weikand, by this picture. Anybody, any idea what this can be? Think of East Germany, that's where Andreas Weigand comes from, where he... You read part of the book, so you've seen the picture, right? Yes, the yeah. Stasi file. So the story, about this, is, the story about this is that um, my dad spent a few years in East Germany in prison because they thought he was an American spy. So what I talked about it this morning, that I'm interested in spying, that has long roots. And after he uh, died, uh, I thought I would like to get his Stasi file. So I wrote the letter uh, to the Gauk Behörde, and uh, then I got the letter back a few months later, saying we are sorry, you know, your dad's file has been destroyed to protect the informants. But since you asked, here would be yours. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, you know, uh, I was a grad student in 89. So when they started this, I was still an undergraduate. So it's interesting how much work they put in to actually collect data. And nowadays, what they wouldn't have gotten out of people under torture, we happily reveal on Facebook. Yes, and the question, of course, is that a good thing if you look at these documents and uh, a Stasi regime using these data? So that's, that's something that I think will come back in the talk. Um, Andreas Weigand, very, very welcome. Thank you for being here at Stum Generale. His expertise is the future of big data, social uh, mobile technologies, and consumer behavior. He studies people and the data uh, they create. As Amazon chief scientist, he helped create the first data strategy and customer-centric culture at Amazon Con. I don't know if you have this Amazon. Oh, yeah. So, so <laughs> this was your Amazon Con time. <laughs> is uh, I do not know how the left picture was made. So I am clear, and I cross-checked. It is my teddy bear. So I still have the teddy bear. The teddy bear is 58 years old now. Uh, uh, on the right, clearly, is Jeff Bezos, and this clearly I have my books in the background. And I don't know how the left picture happened. And the right picture I found in Business Insider that somebody put on that picture. I forgot what the context was. So the teddy bear story, there must be a story there. I don't know the story, and unfortunately, I couldn't find it on the web either. Yeah. But that was for my... But this is online somewhere. This, online. You come across it, and you have no, no idea how they made it, and who made it, and whatever. I have no idea. Your bookshelf, but your teddy. Google finds those things for you. Yes. <laughs> he, <laughs> they put them on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there was no Facebook then. Okay. <laughs> he, uh, he teaches at Stanford University and UC Berkeley directs the social data lab and speaks at uh, corporate events and top conference like the one tomorrow of course around the globe he received his phd in physics from stanford university after studying in germany and cambridge the uk and he lives in san francisco and it says on your website shanghai yes i'm selling my place i am done with the great firewall and the difficulties there so if somebody wants to buy my shanghai condo 
you know, we should have a conversation. You're moving to Bangkok, right? Yeah. So traveling all over the world. And for the last 20 years, he has worked with global clients, including Alibaba, Best, uh, Best Buy, Goldman Sachs, Lufthansa, Saab, Singtel, Thomson Reuters, and the World Economic Forum, as well as with many successful and exciting startups. I don't know if this is a startup. Yes, so it is. that was my Christmas day in 2004. And, you know, I look like one of the two guys on the picture, and the other guy is Jack Ma. And he hired me as his data coach. And it's fascinating how he so, at the time, didn't know anything about data. But he was listening. For instance, I explained to him the difference between a research programmer and a production engineer. You know, if you get the wrong person, they will be very unhappy and quit before you know it. Um, the other thing from that event where we talked about the future of e-commerce was, I looked at the transcript the other day, that none of us in 2004 mentioned mobile. So sometimes it's amazing how you can totally miss things. The iPhone was only three years you know, away from that. And we did not mention mobile at all. And then what happened here? Because did you mention mobile? And, and that was the day <laughs> after It brings you election. to Putin. Yeah. He's and not here, but um, the Russians won tonight uh, the um, first football match. So that was interesting. And the fact, you know, if you, go, if you think I photoshopped it, I must have done a good job. Because if you Google Putin Weigand, you all know about fake news. If you Google, at least, you know, all the pictures come up. So that was the day after the election. And I was in the air. So I learned about it when I landed in Moscow, shocked like everybody else. The US and I election. was that was the handshake to the first American citizen after the election, and I had no idea about anything. And the other guy is Hermann Greff, who was his economics minister and the CEO of the largest bank. And during the meeting, Hermann left the room. The phone rang and he left. I thought, wow, that is weird. I wouldn't just you know leave in the middle of a meeting. And come back. So I said, "Und was war?" You know, and he said, "Oh well, you know, that we had an attack." Attack. And I thought, attacks come from China, or they come from Russia. I am in Russia. Said, so "Oh, that must have come from China." <laughs> and he said, "No, of course it came from America." So that was the day after the election where the Americans said, "Well, you know, uh, we noticed something, and you know, watch out." And so that was so the day of the elections or the day after the elections. You're in Russia, shaking hands with Putin. I was in Russia because and you didn't know of anything, right? No, I we didn't. You're the I data specialist here. You didn't know anything, right? One of the things I'll talk about tomorrow in the talk is that questions are more important than answers. But I didn't even know to ask about the election. And now the interesting thing is, the guy paid top dollars, no discount, to get me and three other people for a day of brainstorming and educating him about AI. So, uh, he's, he's learned a lot ever since. And the day after, you're like that was the already joining then, the army. <laughs> then I was in the, then I was, uh, my book launched last year and um, I was in Germany and so I got a call from the Department of Defense. Um, whether I would be free for lunch. And I'm actually going to the Pentagon in two weeks. I'm quite looking forward to that. But I got a call from the German Department of Defense whether I could come for lunch. I said, sure. Um, so then Fregattenkapitän Otter, you know, if that's not a name, you know, Fregattenkapitän Otter. Uh, he greeted me and uh, there were a couple of generals and we had lunch. Not very good, by the way. And then the question came, did you serve? I said, well, <laughs> I played for 15 months. I played the cello in the Stabsmusikor, you know, in the army, in the band. Like when the Queen of England came, you know, we played string quartet. Uh, and, you know, um, then they asked whether I got promoted, and <laughs> I don't remember. I really didn't remember. I couldn't remember it, so I called my brother and said, everybody gets promoted. I managed to not get promoted. <laughs> um, but that they didn't know. So now I'm an 
Oberstleutnant. I don't even know what that is in English. I'm now a two-star officer because they figured if Putin hires me for top dogs, if they give me some rank, then maybe I can tell them some story as well. So that is a story about this me doing a workshop uh, for, you know. The saying is that, that you're always seven handshakes away. <laughs> um, from uh, important people like Putin. I'm only one handshake away now, so if you are interested in being one handshake away of a lot of famous people, even Angela Merkel is going to uh, so ask Angela for your advice, she, she reached do the handshake with Andreas Weigand. Yeah, all right. Please welcome him. This here for his speech on Data for the People, Data for the people Andreas Weigand. Go to the next slide. Uh, so I was, okay. So I think it was actually a super good idea of the lady I worked with in the preparation for this, that this talk, Data for the People, focuses on general things, on society, how data influences pretty much the world we live in, and at the end, what we can do. And I call it data literacy or digital literacy, what here our opportunities, our tasks are as students, as faculty, as guests here at the university to help actually move the world in the right direction. Data for the people, not data against the people, which I have some examples for. Tomorrow in the department, my talk is called People for the Data, where I talk about what it was like to work at Amazon, what it is like to be a data scientist, what the education for the specific people should be. So I love those two aspects rather than packing them all in one talk to have the opportunity to today <coughs> talk about data for the people. And I will do this in three parts. In my first part, I'm talking about data and privacy. In the second part, I talk about the, what I call social data revolution. And the third part, I talk about digital literacy. So I'm a physicist by training. And I always believe once a physicist, always a physicist. So this morning, when I had the sessions with the students, one of the questions was, what does that actually mean? And I didn't give a particularly good answer because I really hadn't thought about it well. But I had a half day to think about it. So I want to start with an example. And that is exponential processes. Some people actually call it exponential technologies because the world we live in, linear things are often eclipsed by exponential things or processes. So let me explain this to you who might not have the background. And the example which I always give is that of rabbits. So let's start with two rabbits, because starting with one rabbit is not um, going to us anywhere. But if you start with two rabbits, a rabbit boy and a rabbit girl, then about a month later, on average, they double. It takes about a month for little baby rabbits to come, and on average, each one has one offspring. So after one month, you have four, and then after two months, you have eight. So you see this doubling. And after a year, you have a thousand rabbits. That is pretty amazing how out of these two rabbits, after one year, you have a whole rabbit farm. I mean, a thousand is quite a bit. I mean, many more people than we have in this room. I mean, rabbits, of course. So after two years, you have a million, if you assume that they don't die, for simplicity here. I actually don't know how long rabbits live, but probably more than a couple of years. So that, that at each point in time, the number of offsprings is proportional to how many living rabbits there are, that is the, no, in the nature of an expansion process. But you didn't invite me to talk about rabbits. You invited me to talk about data. So funnily enough, the same exponential growth also holds for data. Now, an exponential function is characterized by one thing, namely the time of doubling. So for rabbits, it was a month. For data, it's roughly one and a half years. Interesting enough, that is the same 
time constant, the doubling time constant, as we have for Moore's law describing processes. The number of transistors doubles every one and a half years. The number of storage doubles one and a half years. So all these things have this Moore's law constant, which goes back, some people say, to the 60s. So that is pretty amazing to have something that is an exponential process. And of course, this is just counting the data in terms of bytes and bits. If you count in terms of pictures or videos, then you have a different time because we can only take that many pictures a day. By the way, how many pictures are taken a day? I don't know. But another way how physicists argue is that they argue orders of magnitude. So what I do know is that there's roughly a billion people in the world. So I would say, on average, a person takes a picture a day. I mean, some people take less, some people take more, but it is more than a tenth of a picture and probably less than 10 pictures a person a day. So the answer would be, hey, how many pictures are taken a day? Roughly a billion. That is the mindset of physicists, as opposed to somebody Googling it and you know, not really getting an answer. So those are the ways, I think, to answer the question from the morning as two examples of how a physicist thinks about the world. So data. I need to start with Facebook. And last Tuesday, not that long ago, I was visiting a friend of mine at Facebook and uh, this is in building 23. So I checked in and check-in is always interesting because Facebook totally knows who I am. I mean, the face recognition is not that difficult. White glasses, guy, they know where my phone is. But they insist on a government-issued ID when you check in. So that means they don't really trust their own data. I mean, my lame California driver's license, I mean, you can buy that on the dark web for you know, 20 bucks. But my Facebook ID with the data from 10 years there's no way you can fake that. So that's interesting that they trust the government issue ID more than their own software. Anyways, so Building 23 and my friend said, oh, Andreas, you know, here is the integrity group. And I asked him, so what is integrity for Facebook? Because I was not happy to hear things you know, over the last few months. I think nobody was. And oh, integrity for us means that we can find fake news. That's it. So, for me, the big disappointment of the last months in Facebook was not the data business. It was that it is a lack of people doing what they are saying. And day after day, things coming out. And just last week, um, the day after I was there, oh, it turned out that companies, they said they were not giving data to they were actually giving data to as long as late as 2015. So that is for me the really disappointing story. Um, I've heard the rumor that uh, Mark might be tried for perjury, which is lying under oath. And if you think there are good precedences for that. In the 1990s, n um, several tobacco CEOs all said, you know, that thing about addiction is not true, but they knew better, so they lied under oath. In the 2000s, you probably know the Enron uh, examples. Um, 2017, last year, the American head of Volkswagen, he is in prison right now for the diesel scandal because he knew and he's serving seven years in prison. So. I actually think this is very serious if somebody clearly knows what the case is and deliberately lies to Congress or in the EU lies to the members here. I'm not saying that Mark did, but I'm saying that is sort of my disappointment to hear every day. Today, Facebook told me, Andreas, we care for your data. And I think, you know, please leave me in peace. Don't show me lies. And then on the other hand, today in the morning, 
we looked at what Facebook believes my interests are. And believes my top interest is soccer. I've in my entire life been to one soccer game. I mean, how is it possible that I have never liked or disliked or even bothered looking at anything soccer related? And number one in my interest is soccer. So how is it possible that they are so bad? So that is more my disappointment here. So, um, in the bigger picture, uh, with Facebook sort of uh, dealt with here, I think it is three things which come together to provide us with progress. One is technology. You know, the technology, mobile as an example, clearly enables us to do things which we have never done before. It's an important vector, some people say, fact in the future. Two, and uh, that should be pretty much in anybody's mind here. Did you also get these emails like a couple of weeks ago saying, hello, um, can you please click here so we continue, can continue to spam you? Yeah, yeah. So great, that is GDPR at work and that has changed the way companies treat their users. And there are so many companies I completely forgot that they had my email address. So um, regulation or law is, I think, just as important as technology is. And the third one is social norms. So an example is, I saw a Facebook post of somebody I know not particularly well, and he made something which looked like a screenshot where somebody else looked really bad. And then I was wondering to myself, well, how do I know that this really was a screenshot? Or maybe he just mocked up something which looked like a screenshot to make the other person really look bad. So actually, you know, you realize that it's turtles upon turtles, that in many cases you actually don't know what is the case. But becoming digital literate means that we know to ask questions and that we know we are aware. So that is this triangle where we have regulation, social norms, and technology. Another triangle which I think is important is the balance of power that comes with those technological changes. And here specifically the balance of power between individuals, government, and companies. So. GDPR and the right to be forgotten clearly is about regulation saying something about individual and companies. Me going back and forth between here, United States and Asia, it is really interesting how the difference is between, let's say, here and the US. In Europe, people tend to trust the government but are suspicious of companies. In the US, it is totally the other way around. I trust Google. A government, I'm not so sure. And why? Because what's the worst Google can do to me? Yes, they can digitally kill me. Somebody enters Andreas Weigand and nothing shows up. That is pretty dramatic. But the government can put me in prison which is even more dramatic. So I think it's interesting that difference that we trust companies here, you distrust them, we trust here, um, uh, the government and the US, we have a deep-rooted distrust against the government. China. Two weeks ago or three weeks ago by now, I was at a company called Tencent. It's a large company in Shenzhen, outside Hong Kong, mainland China, and they make software called WeChat. Who of you has heard about WeChat? Okay, great, almost everybody. So I think it's the most interesting experiment which ever has been carried out on people. That you have a billion plus people using Facebook on a daily basis, Messenger, 
revealing you know who they're interested in they even measure what you are typing and then you delete it so now facebook knows that you were thinking somebody to really insult them but before you send it you delete it and said oh thank you for your message <laughs> that's one world and then separate it with a great firewall the you know firewall in china which makes it very difficult to use Google and other things in China. Then you have the WeChat universe. And so I gave a talk at Tencent, they invited me to the workshop actually with the title, What Can We Learn From Facebook? And I started and said, you know, I'm looking for the button, whether somebody has read a message, because in Messenger or in Apple, we are used to delivered and read. No, we don't have that button. Oh, okay. Then I was looking for, well, somebody sent me a friend request. Can I see who the friends we have in common, who the friends that we have in common? Oh, no, of course we are not showing the friends in common, which is kind of weird to me as well. Because if somebody wants to be my friend, shouldn't I know a little bit more about them? And then I uh, clicked at the WeChat profile of you know, the host who invited me, and it said, a city. It said, Honolulu, Hawaii. I said, Wow, I mean, you know, you're clearly lying. And he said, oh, no, it doesn't mean the city you are in. It's maybe the city I would like to think about taking a vacation. So, you know, it is just so interesting. And then pushing it one step further, I was going to look up actually that picture of Jack Ma and me. And it said, not found. And I said, wow, don't we have a right to be remembered? Don't you have some responsibility to keep my data? I mean, I trust you that you keep my data. And they said, what are you talking about? And they explained to me how what happened at Facebook could not have happened at WeChat. And Chinese culture, the way I see it, based on Taobao, Alibaba, WeChat, is built on the absence of trust. So here we talk, we trust the government, in the US we trust companies, Chinese, maybe the Cultural Revolution, I don't know what really gets us to that point, no trust. So the reason eBay failed in China was that people trusted, but they were brutally taken to the cleaners. So WeChat also does not trust the government. So what uh, Dawson Tang said, look, Andreas, do we want to get daily phone calls by Xu Jinping and saying, oh, we would like to get the record of that person? No. So what we do is the moment you download a message, it's gone. It is no longer there because that's our way of preventing the government showing up or, you know, data being handled over to other places. And I thought that was interesting. First, I thought it was bug to feature you know, making a bug of, you know, not being able to run servers um, to a feature of saying, you know, we don't have the data. But during the day of uh, that conversation, it really became clear to me that they're actually very serious about that. That, hey, if we don't have the data, then the government really, <laughs> they can't show up. But, you know, it gets boring for both sides if they try to. By the way, when I checked in at WeChat, Tencent headquarters, what do you think they wanted? I mean, I, again, have a WeChat account, had for many years, I have a thousand uh, relationships there, they know all of them. Here, he thinks my face, that was part of it. And they want my phone number. And I said, why do you need my phone number? I mean, WeChat is replacing the de facto infrastructure of communication in this country. They said, well, for you to get that China mobile, you had to show your passport. So even WeChat, via the phone number, which is good for basic authentication, they also ultimately resort to the identity that is your passport. I personally think, you know, all white guys look the same. I mean, when I end up with my passport, half of you could end up with my passport and they wouldn't notice. But ultimately, when it comes to, you know, getting after people and putting them in prison, you know, they think that the passport is what is more important than the WeChat. So I absolutely believe that we should hold those companies accountable in a number of ways. In my book, Data for the People, actually lists six 
rights we should have as consumers, which are all assuming that the data actually is there, that they take care of your data. And I just want to mention a couple of them. One is the right to see your data. And I love that GDPR actually has that. And you know now Facebook allows you to download the data. Google does a very good job of allowing you to see your data. For instance, geolocation. If you haven't looked at your own location history, I recommend you do it. It's amazing how well Google visualizes everything. You can go back years and want to know how many minutes do I spend at that restaurant or massage parlor or whatever. And it's, of course, highly, highly sensitive. You know so much if you know where a person is 24-7. It is crazy how much you know. But Google does a good way of showing you your geolocation data. That's an example of a good um, visualization. Facebook just, you know, dumps the data and good luck, young man, here are the bits. And according to the GDPR, actually that is not enough. It has to be in a format that people can interpret and understand. Um, there's right to inspect the refineries that I would like to know, you know, how secure are my data there? Security, unlikely events. And I also want to know how efficient are they with using my data? Meaning, every time there is a query, do they just send over the entire record they have about me? Or do they really only give the data that is necessary? So, for example, um, I don't have a German ID card anymore, but the new ID cards, apparently, when you want to buy cigarettes, you have to be, I think, 18 or 16 to buy cigarettes. So you insert the ID card, and they don't read out your name because they don't know you need to know your name. All they need to know is the person who you know, owns this ID card be above 16 or below 16. So that is the way it should be that you only get the information which you need to make the decision you need to make, but don't collect more information. In contrast, of course, Facebook collects all kinds of things just in case it might be useful someday. And uh, I want you to be sort of aware of that principle that you should design the system that only the information you really need gets passed on. That's sort of a data efficiency is a characterization of my right to inspect the refineries of making a decision whether I take my data to that data refinery or to that data refiner. By the way, data refinery for me is, uh, means a factory which you give data and they mix your data with the data of other people to usually help you make a better decision. Google is a perfect example. You enter a query and they give you something back which helps you to figure out where to have dinner or which flight to book. So those are the two rights we should have for our data, to see our data, and the second one is to inspect the refineries. Now, what is the value of data? Any idea? What's the value of data? How do you determine the value of data? Okay, so let's say I'm a physicist, they have 100 billion uh, as market cap and they have 1 billion users, so that would be $100 per user. Another way of looking at it is you can look at the profits Facebook makes and it turns out if you look at this, it's about a cup of coffee a quarter for, you, for each user. But by your gut feeling, you know, if I have a free communication tool or a cup of coffee, I think I would probably go for the communication tool. So maybe there's another way of thinking about the value of data besides market cap or profits divided by the number of users. Any other idea? Uh, the, the, uh, 
value of what I need to spend to collect it and what I need to spend to protect. Aha. Beautiful. Collecting and protecting. I would say collecting and connecting data. Um, now, I would argue that is negligible. Those costs, also storing and so on, is negligible compared to the value the data has. No. There, um, uh, so on the one hand, your data grows. On the other hand, the costs go down. So, but if it's negligible, I want to think about it in a different way than even if it's, if it's you know, um, for Facebook, it's a lot of money. F per user, a dollar probably, the cost. But what's the value? So here's what I want to drive to. The value of data is the decision that data impacts. So that, I think, is a pretty good way of thinking about data. That if no decision depends on it, then good luck in getting somebody to pay you for it. If, on the other hand, decisions depend on it, the classic case, of course, being ads, which you are shown, then you can get people to pay you something for it. And equally well, if I ask you for you know, the way to my hotel, and it's late at night and I had a beer too many, then you know, if you are telling me it's over there, that is valuable for me, because my decision to walk left versus to walk right depends on it. If I just ask you, you know, a name of a hotel and I have no intention to do anything with it, then you know, value is pretty, it's pretty small. Thinking about that a story about the light. When I was an undergraduate, I learned about a good story which I just want to tell you. In the evening, a man is on the street looking for the key for his car. So, and Holland's probably his bicycle. But I mean, the way I learned was he's looking for the car. So some other guy comes and you know, the guy is drunk, the other guy too, and says, what are you doing? Um, I'm, I'm looking for my keys, my car keys. Um, and the guy said, so you left them there? He said, no, I left them over there. Why are you looking here? Because that's where the light is. <laughs> so in many cases, I think if we don't start with a question, but we start with the data, we are precisely in that mindset that we are looking you know, where the light is as opposed to we're looking for getting answers to our questions. Um, so we have uh, the two rights to see and then we have four rights to act because acting, making decisions is really what the value of data is. Um, one of them is the right to port your data. And I wrote my book before I knew about GDPR. So the porting is another beautiful example where technology, social norms and regulation comes together. You remember that triangle I drew in the air before. Let's say you're applying to grad school. And for grad school, you need to provide a transcript. So in the olden days, you had to fax it to somewhere. So, you know, who knows where that fax goes? And the number which you're faxing it to, you know, might be some fake institution. Like in China, there are so many institutions that just provide fake diplomas. Or on the other hand, if you apply to Stanford, who knows that you didn't fake your diploma? So in this case, technology and the combination of two technologies is the answer I want to give here as the right to port, which should be part of the right to port. It's not just emotion, I want to take my data. No. The two technologies are one, and that's the first time I'm mentioning the B word today, not BS, but BC, blockchain. Namely, blockchain means that the data sits somewhere and you can't alter it. Today, a law was passed in Michigan, I just saw today, that uh, there's up to 17 years, so it's a criminal offense, to try to alter data, including alter data on the blockchain. Just today, if you Google that Michigan um, blockchain, I'm sure it comes up as a hit for today. So blockchain, however, the way it's designed, expensive and it's computationally, 
it provides you with a way where you can be pretty sure that the person didn't fake their transcript or health history or financial history or whatever you want. But that's only half of the game because I also want to be in charge of my data. So I want to encrypt the data. And so now if you combine encryption where I have the key and only if I pass the key to you can you actually understand what this data is about. Otherwise, it's a total garbage. Now, that is a nice symmetrical part that I can't fake it. So I only have, you know, what is the truth, but you can't read it unless you get my key. So this is an example here how the technologies du jour come, come together and actually solve a problem, namely the right to port, which is not looking, you know, here's blockchain as a technology, looking for applications, but it really is a problem which we would like to have, that we want to make sure that we are in charge, and the other party wants to make sure that the data we're giving them is actually true. Okay. Now, what does this have to do with trust? In some way, it takes a Chinese model that you don't have to trust the other person and replaces it by technology. So, you know, who do we know whether we can trust some random person, some random letter? We don't. But we now have technologies which we do trust much more than we would have trusted before a letter we got. But we had no alternative then. Now, I want to talk in the second part about the social data revolution. Social data for me is data, two meanings. One, data that is socialized by people. Like, you know, I put the article I saw today about the Chinese having had a contest on facial recognition for pigs. You know, I thought that was pretty amusing. So I might want to socialize this. So in that case, I put it on Facebook or Twitter. And it is social data because I send it out. Another reason for the word is the social graph. Who are the people I communicate with? My telephone records, my WeChat, my Facebook messenger graph, what's up in this country. So those are social data. And the point I want to make is that this social data revolution has changed the way a billion people, not some edge group in Silicon Valley, but a billion people actually lead their lives. Think how you buy things. You know, there used to be days where you go to a shop and the shop assistant tells you, oh, that is a good product. You know, you couldn't look up reviews. I mean, they were making it up as they were talking to you. Or maybe it's the one with the highest profit margin. Who knows? But think about how our process of what we buy and how we buy it has been changed. They're not just ours, but a billion people. Social commerce is another way that we now buy things in very different ways from before. Second example I want to give is what we know. I use Google every day. And what it means to educate, to learn, is very different from what it meant to educate and to learn 20 years ago. Have we actually taken that into account or do we still teach people things that you know, computers can do much better? Reinhold Niebuhr, the theologian, has a prayer and basically says, Lord, give me the power to change what I can change. Give me the serenity, the ability to accept what I can't change and the wisdom to tell the difference. So I think we often have to rethink whether we really have the wisdom to let computers do what computers are good at and let people do what people are good at, but not confuse the two. So uh, Google is a good example where I think many things we know. Oh, did you learn spelling in high school? I even in primary school had schön schreiben, you know, writing nicely. <laughs> I mean, maybe not that important anymore. 
So I think rethinking about what people can do, how we can do it, what computers can do is important. Social data revolution and the impact on work. Not only how work is changing, but also how workers are changing. I mean, what working is changing, what is work, is just so dramatically different from what it used to be. So there's a company in San Francisco where I learned that uh, the CEO said, well, if you want to work here, you have to wear a Fitbit, like, you know, one of these fitness trackers, 24-7. And then a person came in the morning and he said to her, you know, I see that you didn't have a good night's sleep, meaning you stayed up too late. I'm sorry, I don't think we need you in this meeting. That is disturbing. But on the other hand, I can see if it's a really important meeting and she is still having a hangover, um, that he might not want to leave that impression with the client. But where does work end? Where does, you know, we're negotiating the boundary to privacy here. And there was a case against Uber last year, which Uber lost, uh, where Uber required people to have the app on, even when they're not riding for Uber. And uh, some courts said, this is none of your business, Uber, what people are doing when they're not working for you. So how far do we want to go? I think symmetry goes a long way. If my boss, let's say the one who asked me to have his, my Fitbit on at night, if he also is willing to have his Fitbit on 24-7, that would be a different situation. I still don't know whether I would want to work there, but certainly the asymmetric, the one-sided mirror where they can observe you, but you have no idea what they are doing, I am not a big fan of that. So data symmetry, think how you can actually, in a workplace, make things symmetric. How can you actually make the life of the work, worker better? Um, there are chairs which sense how you're sitting on them. I had in class at Berkeley two years ago the CT of a company called Emotion, which got since bought by Apple, where they can read out with a high-resolution camera up to 400 people's emotions in real time. That is just absolutely crazy. That, you know, the camera is sitting there innocently. They know that people over there on the right, they are dozing off. Whereas people on the left there, they are still on the ball. So uh, maybe I should pay more attention to the people <laughs> at the right here. And they give me that feedback. So they analyzed the video where I was talking to the dean. The dean came to class. I deleted that part of the emotion <laughs> analysis. <laughs> um, so these are examples for work. Another example is insurance. I was on Monday evening at a dinner in Cologne, which is traditionally uh, lots of insurance, about insure tech, which is insurance traditionally is built in a world where we do not have data. Like most of our laws are made in the world without data, like speed limit. The speed limit is 50 kilometers per hour in a village. You know, it doesn't depend on whether it's raining and uh, dark, and, and again, I had a beer, or whether, you know, it's morning, bright sun out, I'm, it's the same speed limit. How is that possible? With 50 kilometers at night, you know, it's way too fast during the day. Maybe it could be more than that. But they are made in a time when we didn't have the data. So insurance. Every child born in China now has its DNA sequenced. That is pretty scary. Or is it amazing? Is that a dystopian future? Think about all these paternity cases. You know, we don't even want to think about it. Um, or is it a utopian future? Let, think about the process in medicine, the progress in medicine that we are making. Because we now you know, have the DNA, we know, we don't know how it goes. This, the decisions we need to make, hopefully in a democratic way, about what 
we want and how we want it. So that is an example of the social data revolution. We talked about work. Now we are talking about insurance. We can talk about health. I think we can talk virtually about every sector of the society and of the economy and look at how that is changing and not just changing by a little bit, but dramatically changing. So should we insure people based on you know, things they are really not responsible for their DNA? If we just optimize the profit of a company, then that seems to be the right thing to do. But, and I think, again, I applaud the EU for that, where gender, for instance, can't be used to determine insurance premium. Because we still live in a world with lots of gender discrimination, gender gapping, good example, in terms of pay. And by saying you cannot look at the data, you know, you make a point. But then, you know, if somebody is called John, I'm not looking at the gender. It just turns out that Johns tend to live shorter than Johannas. So how do you go, how do you force companies to actually not indirectly look at gender? Just by looking at first names. An US example which was outlawed was using zip code like the postal code of where you live for car insurance. On the one hand, it makes total sense that if your car is in some you know, poor area where people break in every other day, that you have to pay a higher premium for your, your car than if you live in a rich neighborhood. But it turns out that this unfortunately is correlated with race. So what you effectively were doing was charging African-Americans much more than you charge white people. And the government said, we don't want that implicit discrimination. Even if it makes sense from the predictive model, we believe that this should not be the case. Actually, since I live in San Francisco, I'm very excited that last week were the midterm elections that an African-American woman is now the new mayor of San Francisco. I mean, there is progress, maybe not a big deal for Holland, but for the United States, this is actually, um, I think, pretty, pretty cool. I mean, we're not talking about Trump. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, you, you take the little things you, you can get. Um, I want to end with another um, loop which brings back China and brings back the concept which we had at the beginning, namely of exponential. So we all are reading and thinking about AI. So I should say I did my PhD actually at Stanford on neural networks in 91, which some people think uh, is an important technology to learn from data. It was the first thesis which did predictive models with neural nets. And I just got lucky because my PhD advisor thought that was a cool topic. I had no idea about any of that. Um, so the amount of computation used, typically you measure how many operations are done per second, for instance. That's a pretty robust measure. How many operations does the computer do? The Moore's law is, and I just remind you of that, that things double every one and a half years or 18 months. A study came out a month ago or so that the number of flops used in AI, the number of operations used for AI operations, doubles not every 18 months, but every three and a half months people put just so much more energy and effort and chips behind AI that doubling every three and a half months means that in a year, you have a factor of 10. That combined with this exponential nature, it's been going on for a few years. People are pretty good who wrote that paper. Uh, so that even baffles me that in a year from now, will spend 10 times as much compute power on AI compared to now. So 
we live in an interesting time for sure. I started off talking about data, but it's really data plus algorithms, plus actions, plus what you do with it. I promise to end before nine. It is a couple of minutes before nine, so we have now time for questions. Thank you so Can far. Maybe a glass of water would be nice yes, for you. Yes, thank you, actually. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Prost. <laughs> so um, I noticed this, this quote on your website saying, big data is here to stay. Now it's time to be empowered by it. Yeah. How do we do that? Data literacy, I think, is the most important. Understanding what the consequences are of sharing data. My position is that we cannot fight the battle about creating data. So we create data just by breathing. I mean, face recognition is a perfect example. I just learned from a Japanese research paper that if I'm waving my hand like this, cameras are good enough to get my fingerprint read out. And that means if I go to SFO, the airport in San Francisco, uh, by the way, we don't show passports anymore. I just put two fingers down, and for some reason the fingers didn't work on Sunday, so they did a retina scan. And then my picture comes up and saying, are you on this flight? And I'm just amazed so how you know, physical properties change. So understanding, here's one example. Um, again in the news today, um, is this old topic of people at the FBI wanting a backdoor into encryption like iPhone, just not understanding that if you have a backdoor for the FBI, there will be some criminals who are at least as good as the FBI. By the way, the FBI couldn't even figure out how many phones they had last year waiting to be unlocked. So, uh, you know, just uh, you know, getting the standard right. So people should just simply learn that they can't ask for things which don't make sense. And for us it means, you know, when I take a taxi and the driver says, where are we going? And I tell him, oh, that's none of your business. That is my, that's my private information. That ride isn't going far. <laughs> so for me, being empowered is to resist companies that they want to have information about you which they don't need, but also to know when they do need something, why you are giving it. So final sentence here is, which I'll talk about tomorrow is um, when you have a startup or when you have a company, you should be very clear that the user understands how his or her world will be better by giving you truthful data. When British Airways asked me in order to uh, you know, access something, what's the email address? Of course, it's a at b.com because that's the minimum parsing they do. If it's a comma at the end, if it's an S sign, it's a legal email address. Why would I give them my... But on the other hand, if I want something from them, then of course I give them the right address. So that is sort of being empowered, also empowered to say no, if it's not in my benefit, but in the benefit of the chief marketing officer or someone. Questions from the audience? And introduce yourself. Uh, to Toby Walsh. Um, isn't the worrying conclusion from the fact that the compute power going into AI systems doubling every three months, that power will be concentrated in the hands of the few that have the compute power? Uh, and then yes. secondly, that we'll run out, we'll run into the technological exactly. limits. So we used to say data is a new oil. And I actually said this myself at a talk I was invited to give to the General Assembly of the United Nations like eight years ago. But many people said it before me as I found out after the fact when I looked it up. Now, oil is a zero-sum game. You know, if I have it, you don't have it. If you have it, I don't have it. And the point I made about data is always that data is not a win-lose game, but data can be a win-win game. If I share my data with you and you share data with me, as an example for data refinery, we are both better off. But when it comes to compute power, then we suddenly are back, not data as the new soil, 
where you know many things can blossom without getting used up but we are sort of back to the data is you know the old oil or data needs a lot of oil for being processed uh, another article today, I don't read actually news much, I just said like half an hour today when I was in a cafe and only hit my iPhone, was that uh, there is an article that uh, China is effectively manipulating Bitcoin prices because they have so much power, um, or so cheap power, that they can actually, you know, get this done, which we wouldn't be able to get done here. So it is also an energy game that we talked about yesterday. Uh, that um, Ireland use as much energy as the Bitcoin miners do. The country of Ireland use as much energy as people use to create Bitcoin, to mine Bitcoin. It's pretty crazy. It does bring us back to the question of trust, I think. How can we trust companies like that? I mean, where is the power indeed? And how can we empower ourselves if we have the feeling that we cannot, we cannot uh, have the power to change things? Yeah. So when we talk power here, we mean physical power, we mean electricity, which is uh, different from the other power, which is that uh, the rich get richer. It is more and more difficult to compete with Google about data. No startup has a chance compared to you know, what Google has amassed over the years. Very tricky. Yeah, so power as in the power of data. There is one answer to that. Uh, th there's one natural answer, right? It to, to, uh, yeah. to what? To, uh, to, the to the fact that we have, that Google is uncompetitive because no one can compete because they don't have the data. Yep. They don't have the compute power to compete. About it. So we had this before in the Industrial Revolution. We had this with Microsoft. Standard Oil. Oh. With Standard Oil, big oil. Standard Oil was broken up. Oh, I didn't know. Standard Oil had um, ninety-eight percent of the of the world's um, oil refinery at one point. I mean, we had with AT and T in the United States, with, yeah, and then uh, you had big telecom and with, big with the airlines. Uh, um, all, so, all of these markets stop being competitive at some point, but because they become monopolistic. But the big problem is that if you break up Google, then the United States loses one of its main assets. Oh, but it's easy to break up Google. They've already dis defined how you could do it. They've, they've constructed Alphabet, right. told you the parts are independent operating ent entities, so therefore you could at least break it up into the parts of Alphabet. Um, however, I, so I don't... So there are alphabets, Google still knows. I, I lost my phone in Uber. So I bought one at Heathrow, uh, where I was changing, yeah, Heathrow. And then, you know, uh, you log in, Andreas, uh, evagen at gmail.com, and within minutes, everything is there. They know your search history. And uh, so it is pretty unified as user experience. And I'm actually happy that way, that I don't have to rebuild every single thing but my Gmail, I said, just giving Google the one thing. So the breakup is maybe the, you know, the self-driving cars and labs and stuff like this. But for search, email, uh, the, the stuff we think about when we think about Google ads, there's no breaking up there. Okay. Ads is a one-trick pony. Everything is run on ads. So they can't break that up. Let's move to another question here. Yeah. Yes? Hello, thank you very much for your talk. My name is Moritz. Uh, I'm a student here and also at the Lux to study at UC Berkeley. Yeah. Yes. And my question for you would be, do you think Facebook would be a viable business model if they treat data responsibly? And what would be the incentives basically to do so for companies? The answer is yes. Like Google treats data responsibly, it's a valuable business model. And as I said, the problem I have with Facebook is the lack of integrity. That it is, I think, just unacceptable. That, and I don't know whether they're lying to themselves or whether they're just lying to us. But I mean, I was told today that they care about me. So, you know. <laughs> um, the alternative, and many people have proposed this, is how much money are paying you for your mobile phone bill a month? 
50, baht, 50 euros or 15. Oh, that's a good deal. I mean, I think most of us pay more than that. But, I mean, what percentage of that would you be willing to pay for communication infrastructure for Messenger? I think probably 10% of my telco bill. So in your case, still a dollar, $1.50 or one euro fifty. So it's more than 1%, less than 50%, something like order of 10%, I think, which is, I think on average, if Facebook has 10% of the communication charges in the world in their pocket, they are not a poor company. So it maybe is the mindset that we think what is our attention worth? And as I said before, if they only were better than showing me soccer ads, and did I mention they told me they care? At Facebook, they care for me. Um, uh, if they only were better than that, I think you know it would be a better experience. But I don't know how the ads are for you. In my case, the ads are pretty pathetically bad for a company which knows so much about me. They should do a better job. There's one in the back trying to reach you. Maybe somebody can hand on the microphone. Uh, so thank you for the talk. Christopher Monchan from the Faculty of Law from uh, the uh, Center for Privacy and Cybersecurity. Great. So um, my question concerns the big promise of blockchain-based personal data management platforms. And you see a lot of startups that are touting sovereign identity solutions and so on. And um, I personally have my gripes with it from a legal perspective, but also from a technical perspective, because they assume um, that there's a clear data ownership model, which from the technical side might work, but from the legal side, especially looking at GDPR and these kind mm -hmm. of laws, um, I don't believe that this is the model that the law really gives people the power that is vested in people because it's always a balance. So who should know what? And um, from the technical side, I don't believe that we're at the state of interoperability and compatibility because the idea is that this will link into everything, every platform out there and put me as an individual in control of my personal data. So uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yes. So the first one is that the notion of ownership which comes from the physical world. In German, I assume the same is true in Holland. You have Besitz und Eigentum. So there it's, there's reasons why things are the way they are, and very smart people have thought about this for hundreds of years. But it is different for something you cannot sit on, for non-physical objects. And I... Uh, heard a podcast um, maybe from a month ago where somebody made the argument that it is against the interest of the user if they sell their data. The German word veräußern. Is there a Dutch word like this? If in doubt, there's probably a similar word that you can... Uh, in English, says inalienable rights. And... Um, What, what is the word for if you can actually sell yourself? <laughs> unverbringbar. That sounds like the right word. So that is what the person said. Your data should be unverbringbar. Because if they are, then you give somebody else the right to do with it whatever you know, you give them because they paid for it. And that means that they, for instance, can deny you access to your rights. So it is sort of the same level as, um, you know, human rights that uh, some things which you are just simply not allowed to sell. Uh, so there is an argument that it's actually bad uh, for the people um, if they have ways of selling their data if it's done in the way physical objects are sold. Um, Not an expert on this, um, but I thought it was an interesting argument. What my argument is in the book is that in many cases, data are actually jointly produced. So if I respond to the Studium Generalis post, Facebook post, 
and say something and then they change something they post. Maybe my remark now looks really stupid. It was really brilliant before, maybe not for a Studium Generale announcement. But if a friend says something and they change their mind, they edit the post and now I seem to be totally you know, mindless what I said. So who owns that post? You know, it's sort of jointly owned. And I don't know whether the legal um, law is you know, thinking. I'm sure there are very smart people thinking about it in the right way. But I certainly don't know whether there is a socially acceptable way of co-ownership. Um, and from the blockchain perspective, uh, specifically what you asked, um, I am convinced that blockchain is the solution to anything. Flat feet, impotence, hair loss, <laughs> blockchain is the answer. <laughs> Um, so, time will tell. I think it's interesting that my last two TAs from Berkeley, um, both just absolutely wonderful, great people, that one of them dropped out of school to do some blockchain ICO consultancy, and the other one is doing some blockchain um, Bitcoin investments, and they both hope to get rich quick. So I think um, I'm not a big fan of that. And they come with the argument, very, I'm going to talk about it actually tomorrow, they come with the argument that, oh, these amazing opportunities, Andreas, you don't understand, you know, and my argument is, you know, amazing opportunities come every year, every month. So it's more important to actually finish and get your degree because that takes time and you are not going back in five years when you know the blockchain hype has disappeared but who knows maybe they are right maybe these times are different but i think you know people always think that the time they live in is different do you feel like the new gpdr uh, is an improvement uh, gp the, the the privacy laws oh i think um, the privacy laws are super important Uh, because otherwise... Um, yeah, my are they an improvement at this moment? The GDPR? Yes. I, you know, no question about it. So I think I actually made a video. So um, Angela Merkel reached out to me a couple of weeks ago that uh, she's interested in having a digital advisor. And um, yeah, I can tell you that. So then she had the head of the Kanzleramt, the head, her White House head, Video talk, people probably want to know whether I still speak German or you know, whether it would be socially acceptable to be part of that. And, um, and I said, oh, funny, you should ask what I would tell the chancellor. Because I made a recording a year ago with a friend of mine who also went to Stanford 30 years ago. What I did not tell him is that we were totally drunk when we made that recording. <laughs> and at the end, he asked me, Andreas, do you really think they want to hear it? I said, no, I don't think she wants to hear that. And that was the end of that recording. But he said, oh, can you please find this for me? So I think the only choice I had was to re-record something which made more sense. And uh, <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> I don't know whether it would have let me in the country again. Um, but uh, I think GDPR is a very important step. Uh, a side effect, always, the question is always, what are the unintended consequences? And one of the unintended consequences here, people say, is that actually gives even more power to the big companies like Google because they have the resources to deal with enforcement, to deal with compliance, versus you know, the little startup somewhere, you know, they, they are actually relatively more expensive, GDP is more expensive for them than it is for the really big companies. But I think it's a great discussion uh, that people... Now, how do you think if you walk up to 100 people in, in um, some place, Aachen, don't want to sing out something, some town, um, not necessarily a university town, so Master is probably not a good example, but in you think about something, how many of them will have heard about GDPR in Europe, in Central Europe. 10% or oh, they think it's a new beer or new drug, MDMA, GDPR, uh, where can I buy it, <laughs> factory. 10%, do you have a feeling? 
50 percent. 60, somebody 60. said. Yeah. So about it's all in the news uh, lately, so everybody's concerned about it. And you get all those emails. The emails, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, if for nothing else, if you have half of the population think about data privacy, that already was worth, I think, passing the law. Starts that with the awareness you talked about. Any other questions? You want the handshake, right? No, uh, for that. <laughs> he wants the microphone. <laughs> yeah, there's one. I have a very short question. You just said that Facebook uh, takes very bad care of their customers, but you still use it yourself, right? Exactly. So that is the, always the question I get. And um, I took a month of Facebook vacation. So I had a long interview in Süddeutsche Zeitung, which I did in November last year, and then it was published at the uh, week when the Mark Zuckerberg hearings were in D.C. And then, of course, they added this one question. So after all your criticism, are you quitting? And uh, the only answer and the honest answer I gave then is I'm taking a month of Facebook vacation, which was May. So I have to say it was much better than I thought. First of all, you don't waste your time. And secondly, more important than that is those really stupid posts by uh, you know, acquaintances who want to show you how amazing they are. And now your life is not, your happiness is not increasing. Your life is not getting better by, you know, spending 10, 20 minutes a day getting annoyed about your acquaintances. So I can full heartedly, wholeheartedly recommend to take a month of Facebook vacation and then... Why, ju why just a month? Why oh, because, you know, that was sort of a thing which I could promise. I didn't know, you know, maybe... Uh, and I excluded Messenger from it. So for me, Facebook, the feed, the posting is very different from Messenger. Messenger is infrastructure. So if you're not in Messenger, then you know, people don't reach you and that you can't do. But when I say a month, months are a reasonable experiment. I'm happy to do another month. So I actually miss it much less than I thought. I think, I think it's a problem for many that uh, when you think of it and you think Facebook has some bad qualities, but then again, it's nice to have and you don't bother or you don't and, care. And they care. I mean, they care. Oh, that's true. Yeah, they, they care. Yes. Any other? Hello, uh, Indra Geesink. Um, often exponential growth uh, appears as such, but then it turns out to be logistic growth. No idea. Okay. So uh, I don't think anybody really knows the future. You have uh, people like the um, the guy who is now at Google. Who, yeah, Ray Kurzweil, uh, who think you know. I can read your mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's I'm, I, um, yeah. It's I was. Don't think about his name. So um, Ray, he just says, you know, there are few people like that, that, you know, exponential growth will go on forever. And then the other people, like the, on the other side, Club of Rome, when I was in college, was sort of the big, big problems. And, you know, they were not the case. So I don't think anybody really knows. Um, as I said, with a factor of 10, a year, I think this is just really way beyond what anybody can comprehend. Two, three years in the future, I mean, a factor of a thousand. I'm not smart enough for that. Do you have a positive view on how it's going to be? Because you ask for more transparency, more democracy. Yeah. That you have that's more data for the people, the, the data, data people yeah. themselves. Do you, are you optimistic? Uh, I think it's up to us whether we create a future which we want to live in, where we question the people who have questionable practices, whether we help, how we can help. You know, for me, the opportunity is now with Angela Merkel to try to uh, influence her a bit. Um, it could be the kid in the, on the bus that you discuss 
privacy with him as he is on Facebook missing his stop. Actually, I was <laughs> the other day, I was on the phone with my TA and was, I was so concentrated on the conversation that I missed the last San Francisco exit. I was driving up from Stanford and I find myself on the Bay Bridge. You know, um, like if the kid in the bus is really immersed in his or her Facebook, then have a conversation with them. I think it's us to, uh, in a democratic society to uh, form an opinion and to uh, influence the people who we vote for. I think this is the way which we should take seriously. You know, in a few years, you will be the ones who make the decisions, who your students now. So there's no them out there who will do it. I mean, they will be students now, the people who make decisions 10, 20 years from now. Uh, the the people in Silicon Valley now who are saying it's as addictive as tobacco and needs to be... I mean... Is people in Silicon Valley say again? It's as addictive as tobacco. Oh, yes. And we will look back in the future yes. and think that we should have regulated it like we should have regulated yeah. tobacco quicker. So, um, the... Dad, we'll be talking about this tomorrow. The notion of a fitness function that uh, basically... Um, China is ahead of us uh, when it comes uh, to the fitness function for society. Um, they have created an equation for citizens. And my score is not very high. I think 539 out of 800. Equation for people, uh, which they call their sesame score. And an amazing number of things depend on it what school your child can go to. If your sesame score is too low, that school isn't happening. Uh, of course, what job you can have. If it's really low, you cannot even take the high-speed train anymore. Let's forget about planes. So they have created an equation with many terms. For instance, children, according to Chinese law, which an interpreter translated for me because I couldn't believe it, are legally obliged to visit their parents. So I'm just, I'm happy to see my mom next week. She's 93. But I'm just imagining if I went there because otherwise she would sue me if I didn't show up. And that would be a pleasant visit, wouldn't it? So um, they created that equation with many terms, including you know, children visiting their parents. And they come up with a score. And... Uh, they distribute scarce resources according to that score. So I'm not sure whether the score is right. By the way, there are ways to fix it. So for example, um, if Rob and I are friends and Rob makes a post which really the government doesn't like, then they come to me and said, well, why don't you have a conversation with your friend Rob? Andreas, I'm sorry, your score also went down by 10%. But if you have that conversation with Rob, then, um, you know, your score could be reconciliated. Not making it up. Another company called Cash Bus in China, startup which gives loans to people. And in order to get it, you have to say, to give them access to your WeChat friends. So if you miss a payment or your friends get messages, Andreas missed his, uh, his payment. Have a word with him. So uh, uh, they are ahead of us in that they actually wrote down an equation. Whether you agree to it or not is a different question. But that's how the conversation should be in society. What terms do we want to have and what weights do we want to have in front of them? Really? To deny, people, to deny children the right to go to a good school because their parents messed up. But you would. Is denying people the greatest social level. I know. But there are scarce resources. It's a scarce resource, but those people. How do you do Those children, des no, those children deserve access to education. So, Edu education would, random, the would flipping a coin be better? And I would argue flipping a coin was done in a world where we didn't have data. Now we do have data. You, you and I were both able to access um, publicly funded education, the best quality education that was available Absolutely. on the planet. Both of us went to, yeah. to fantastic public funded universities. Absolutely. And it wasn't a question of what our parents did. In fact, no, 
Absolutely. My, my father didn't have any qualifications. My mother didn't yeah. have any qualifications at all. But I was given the, the ability to have the best quality education. And so to okay, go to I a get system your point. where, where yeah. children are denied yes. access to education I get because you. of the mistakes of their parents. Good point. Which may be... Maybe they Absolutely, suffering. I completely agree with you. I is, didn't is get it. Not advancing yes. society is is regressing society. Uh, very good point. Totally However, the notion of people. having <laughs> an equation. I guess tomorrow also speaking at the Congress. The notion of actually having conversation about what should matter and what the consequence should be. I think that's a better better uh, discussion to have than you know not have. A final question here. Okay, you just said uh, that students are the future, and of course they are the future, and they will take the decisions. Uh, but what will happen with elections to prevent them that ah. they won't be manipulated? Pretty soon we have elections in Turkey. I know. So and Erdogan was in a meeting in an AK in his uh, party, and he says, okay, you know... Eh? There are the courts, you know where they vote, take care of it. So Students will take decisions. Eh? Half a year before the last US presidential election, I um, spoke at Berkeley at the, uh, the summit. And I said, I think we should do away with democracy. Because democracy is such, and as I said, half a year before the Trump election, because democracy is just, elections, I mean, is just a random thing, you know, if it rains, you know, if the weather is bad, the turnout is less, and so on and so forth. I think we should have those put the government into place who know us best. And who knows us better than Facebook and Google? So let them put the government into place. It's, it's an idea. <laughs> Who knows how, it goes, how it's going to work. Um, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for coming. I want to thank you for talking with me without getting a message about my debts. And I do want to do the handshake. And yes. <laughs> and not just because um, this is the hand that's going to shake uh, Angela Merkel. Oh. <laughs> Uh, because it's Putin as no, the, picture. the handshake is a warm gesture, a yes. human gesture, not not some digital thing. Uh, to thank you warmly for being thank here you. and doing this talk. Um, if people still have questions, want to ask them personally, he's going to stay uh, yeah. stick around a little bit as long um, as people want to talk to me. Right. I hope to see you back. I thank the Department of Knowledge Engineering again, University of Maastricht, of course. Studium Generale starts again with the PAS Festival. We open with a very nice festival where there's lots of lectures, but also lots of good music uh, in the old buildings here, but also the others of the University of Maastricht on 7 and 8 September. A real festival to start the season and to start your study. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you again.